so much and really, really excited to be here today. Um, I actually graduated from Berkeley in 2007 from computer science and electrical engineering and data science as a major, if you will, wasn't even, uh, wasn't even an option. So it's, it's, it's great to see how Berkeley has evolved. Um, I'm a partner at Foundation Capital. Uh, to give you some context, Foundation is a venture capital firm. So we, we've been investing in early stage startups for uh, 20 plus years now. We have made 200 or so investments and 27 of them have gone public. Uh, Netflix, which is one that I use way too much. Uh, T-Mogul, which is out of Berkeley. Uh, Bolt Threads, which uh, you know you guys, they're not public, but they're also a Berkeley company. Uh, in the public domain, uh, Mobile Iron, Chag, uh, and a whole host of others. And, and for us, it's really important that we back promising young founders and help them go through their journey. I invest in a variety of enterprise companies up and down the enterprise stack. And most of my investments leverage data assets in some way or, or, or another. Today, James and I are here uh, to share two different perspectives of how investors think about the data opportunity. Uh, fun fact before I start, James and I actually met at Berkeley as undergrads. Uh, we're married, and <laughs> so props to Berkeley for that. Um, and uh, uh, and we're both um, we both got into the venture kind of ecosystem after that. Um, and when we were asked to present to you, you know, I, I thought it'd be fun to talk about ordering wine and actually more, more specifically conversational AI. And I think James will talk about computational biology later. More boring. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so anyhow, taking a step back, I believe as an investor that over the next decade, uh, enterprise software will change. I think today we're seeing a lot of workflow-driven solutions uh, in the market. So if you look at Salesforce, what Salesforce did was to look at a human behavior. So sales reps and sales managers need to enter a bunch of data, and they just put together a process for that to happen. Right. So we're like in like the power steering phase of software, if you use the autonomous vehicle analogy. I think over the next decade, what's going to happen is, is that enterprise software will move to a self-driving model. Right, where humans are ass assisting the machines versus the other way around. And the fundamental catalyst for this is going to be data, how companies uh, create data assets, uh, capture data assets, and, 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 and use that as the primary leverage. However, as Bill Gates once said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10 years. So as investors, we have to be very conscientious about what we invest in today, right? And so I look for applications of narrow AI, so specific tasks that humans can, or machines can do as well as or better than humans, and then uh, those tasks with massive business uh, implications. When I think about the applications for narrow AI, there are really three things that come to mind, and I'll briefly go, go through that. The first is I look for companies that reinvent the human to machine interaction. So if you ever watch Westworld, that's a perfect example of how humans are now interacting with machines the way that humans are used to doing so, right? Westworld is this amusement park, or has this amusement park where there's a bunch of robots that act like humans. Uh, in the old world, humans used to interact with machines by talking in the machine language, uh, and now that's changing. More specifically, in conversational AI, the interaction layer innovation falls in two main categories. One is in the man-to-machine interface. So a human interacts with a machine through voice or text, uh, and the machine understands the human um, so it, uh, and takes some kind of action. So in this graph, you can see you know, Siri or Alexa responding to you after you ask Siri to do something. I asked Siri to wake me up this morning. The other flavor of this could be uh, a human-to-human -human interaction and the machine provide, providing a different layer. So if, for example, if James and I have an argument, uh, a, a machine could be listening to us and summarizing our you know, key points on both sides <laughs> and then later on telling us which one, which one of us won. So that's, that's, that's another example. <laughs> The second thing that I look for as an investor is, is data. Uh, uh, data is the oxygen for the AI world, as you guys know. Uber owns no vehicles, Facebook knows, owns no content, and Airbnb uh, owns no accommodations. 
But yet, these are all data companies. Uh, they gather and store enormous amounts of data, and then they use interesting algorithms to derive some actionable insights for, for their consumers. And they've turned uh, the businesses, business models on their heads. Now, what is a good data asset, you may ask? And, and for me, I look for one of three things when I look at startup opportunities. One is that the data asset is truly unique. And to be quite honest, it's very rare to find that, right? Examples of this could be population data uh, in, 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 the, in the biology world. Uh, it could be that uh, some kind of data that nobody has access to, maybe it's uh, from, from, some, from some country. Uh, the second is that's more, uh, that's more uh, popular is probably the scale of data that's proprietary. Uh, and, the, and the creation of the scale continues. So LinkedIn is probably a perfect example of that, where they have uh, you know, access uh, of, to a database of tons of resumes. And these resumes keep on refreshing and creating themselves because people are contributing to this resume base. The third type of data asset that I think is, is, is the most interesting, perhaps, is, that is, where, uh, is one where the, the weight of the data networks uh, are, are different. So to give you an example, Facebook has done this really well, where you know, they have amassed uh, billions of profiles. But what's more interesting about these profiles is the relationship between one and, and another. So uh, perhaps me and the gentleman over there were, were, were not friends. Uh, me and James, we are usually very good friends. And me and this gentleman over there, we, we may be you know, acquaintances. And, and Facebook has a way of understanding the weight of the relationship for this data graph. So I think that's a super, super attractive data asset as well. The third piece uh, as an investor that, that we look for in an AI world is that the AI workloads uh, have very, very different requirements from traditional uh, workloads. And they will result in an entirely new technology stack. Right? Everything from hardware to the code libraries will change. And this will have massive opportunities for enterprise software. So if you think about web infrastructure of, of yesterday, there will be a whole host of uh, infrastructure and applications that will be created uh, because of the implications of artificial intelligence. So let's uh, dive deeper into one example of this. Uh, chatbots, or conversational AI, is a perfect example that captures these three keys. New interfaces, a lot of data, and a whole new technology stack. I first experienced chatbots um, because I, I spent a lot of time in China. And uh, you know, even five years ago, WeChat played a huge role in, uh, in my life when I was there. I would, uh, I, would, I would get hungry, and I would get on WeChat and order some McDonald's. McDonald's would uh, arrive in, in you know, 45 minutes later. Uh, my grandparents needed their, their utilities bills paid, and I would pay it via WeChat. Uh, I may go shopping, and everything is in one interface. So it's really like a central place where I, I'm able to do a bunch of stuff. Now, uh, what has happened in China is starting to happen in the United States. The difference, though, is that China does not have as uh, strict of labor requirements, right? So labor is relatively cheap. Whereas in the United States, as businesses think about this consumer behavior, it's very, very hard to support this kind of interactions uh, using people. And so I started digging into the chatbot space in the US, thinking about what are the opportunities for automation uh, with, with messaging emerging as an interface. And I'll first start with an example of a chatbot uh, in a little bit, and then talk about this market evolution, and then kind of talk about the business implications for different sectors. You probably have seen a chatbot, uh, but who likes to drink wine? Okay, for, for okay, okay, that's 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 better. Who's an expert on wine? All right, that that one guy right there. Well, <laughs> I I'm, I know I know I'm not an expert on wine, um, but I huh? I said there. Well, I, I do know. I know. I love to drink it, right? So uh, I had this issue of trying to figure out what is the right right wine to buy a few weeks ago when I was uh, having a dinner party, and so I went on Facebook Messenger and I you know typed in at Vinery to ask Vinery to help me. Uh, Vinery asked me what was the occasion uh, and the type of food I was having, and it gave me a couple of suggestions of wine, and I picked one and purchased it all in the same interface. Very cool. 
The other time, I was staying at a hotel, and I wanted to work out. So I asked Edward, the chatbot, uh, where the gym was. After my workout, uh, I needed shampoo, so I told Edward. 15 minutes after my chat with Edward, the, the bot, shampoo was delivered to my door by Matt, the human. Uh, <laughs> so that was, that was also really cool. Uh, but you know, taking a step back, some history. Messaging is now a primary interface through which consumers interact with each other. Right? Uh, there are approximately 3 billion people using the top four messaging apps uh, on a monthly basis. This is almost half the world. Uh, messaging has also surpassed other interfaces. Uh, in fact, it's now bigger than social networking. And th this, uh, you can see that messaging surpassed social networking in 2015. Uh, so messaging apps, as you, see, you can see in the middle, are emerging as platforms. And what is a platform in this case? Well, it means that third-party developers can build chatbots on top of them. And I'll explain why chatbots are actually really powerful from a business perspective in a little bit. I'll use mobile as a point of comparison. Uh, today, almost every enterprise company has a mobile app. And I believe that chatbots will be even bigger for, for two main reasons. The first is distribution. Uh, a barrier to adoption for mobile apps historically has always been that as consumers, we had to download this app. right? In the chatbot world, you can easily switch from one chatbot to another by just typing the chatbot name, like I did uh, in my previous slide, uh, at Vinery. And additionally, uh, most of these mes messaging platforms already have audiences of billions of users, so you can easily access them as a business. The second um, uh, piece that's really interesting is the ability to automate the back ends of chatbots. Uh, chatbots use data collect that's collected via messaging apps through the conversations, combined with existing data from enterprise systems. Uh, then it uses AI to understand and learn from and respond. So in my hotel example, um, Edward, the chatbot, responded first. Edward knew that I wanted shampoo because I told him. But Edward also knew that I wanted Pantene shampoo because of all the other data about me that were in other systems that he, he collected before he came to me or before Matt came to me. So from a business perspective, the opportunity is massive. There are two broad sets of opportunities here. One, that chatbots will transform existing human interactions and then create new ca use cases that didn't exist before. So first, it will automate human interactions. Uh, enterprises in the US spend $174 billion per year on human costs that fall in the uh, purview of customer success or sales reps or things that are service oriented. Uh, I believe that 40% of this can be automated today, uh, creating $65 billion of savings for these businesses. And from a software perspective, this is at least $10 million of software potential. Uh, I'll go into some of, the, some of the investments that we made into this space. Uh, but uh, one of them is Maya, which is a recruiter's AI assistant. And Maya automates actually 75% of the recruiter's time. The second opportunity is that enterprises will offer services that were previously too expensive to offer. So for example, taking, uh, uh, going back to Pantene, Pantene has never had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with its consumers before. It was too expensive to reach out to each consumer directly and have a conversation. Uh, instead, it relied on retailers, right? So you had to go to Whole Foods or a pharmacy to buy Pantene. Uh, now, with chatbots and the automation of that, Pantene can actually reach out to every single one of you, tell you what shampoos will make your hair shine, and then sell you that shampoo all in the chatbot. It can take back the 20% margin that it gave to retailers historically. So think about the, the, the disappearing of retailers in the next 10 years. Um, the impact of chatbots cuts, cuts across a variety of sectors, not just B2B or CPG, but also retail and financial services and many, many others. And there are use cases that we haven't even thought about yet. Now, so it's no surprise that enterprises will build chatbots as an extension of their customer-facing um, applications. Uh, now, chatbots are very sophisticated, and like I mentioned, will have a whole new technology stack to support them. Uh, the tech stack will consist of you know, engine applications, app development platforms, analytics, uh, de developer toolkits, 
and a whole infrastructure category as well. And as investors, we see this as, as a huge opportunity uh, to build the enterprises that will survive in the next 10 years. Uh, and so far, I've had the opportunity to invest in you know, Maya, Radiance Lab, and Hustle, which are part of a portfolio. I'll give you one example. So Maya is a uh, AI assistant that, um, that helps recruiters uh, screen and schedule and find, uh, find people to hire. And Maya does this in the blue collar space where there's millions and millions of candidates and millions of job openings, but the matching process is really, really burdensome. ADECO, which is the largest uh, staffing company in the world, uh, makes $25 billion uh, doing this with humans. Right, so Maya automates 75% of this, allowing the recruiters to do something interesting. And it's doing this in, in a conversational way. Right? It texts uh, the candidates and asks them uh, to go through an, through an interview process, and it places them uh, in, in an on-person, in-person inter interview. And the candidates like this better because they, they don't have to wait two weeks to hear back anymore from the recruiters. They can actually hear back right away uh, to see if they, they got an interview. Uh, but if you guys are interested in learning more about some of this, uh, I'm happy to tell you, and uh, we're always looking for more data scientists. Uh, anyhow, so this is, this is a primer on, on conversational AI. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll hand it over to James, who will talk about computational biology. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. Uh, so I'm James. I'm a partner at Data Collective. We're an early stage venture fund. We have close to a billion dollars in our management, uh, and we invest in uh, applied AI and frontier technologies. Uh, as Joanne mentioned, I also went to Berkeley. We met in signals and systems. Considering <laughs> how much better her slides are, uh, I'll let you think about who got a better grade in that class. <laughs> um, great. Well, I only have about 10 minutes, so this is going to be a little bit fast. Um, but hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions afterwards if anyone has any. So I want to I want to posit the last 50 years has been the semiconductor revolution. I think the next 50 years is going to be about the biological revolution. Uh, and one of the things that you know we do as VCs is we try and peer kind of into the future and like what are the trends that are going to kind of support the emergence of new markets or new products. So I'm going to talk about some of those in biology. So as many of you may know, uh, the falling prices of data collection. Um, and if you haven't seen this slide, in the last 10 years, the cost of sequencing has dropped probably three orders of magnitude. Um, and with that, we've seen an explosion of the amount of data that's been captured. Um, and so this is a, this is a forecast, um, I guess, out until 2025 about how many um, in aggregate human genomes will be sequenced. I'm going to go back. In addition to the, to the falling price of data collection, uh, we've also been able to measure biological systems much more precisely. So if you think about how biology used to be done, you'd take some tissue, you'd put it in a blender, and you'd like measure the soup. Um, and that was great, great place to start, uh, but actually didn't give us a lot of insight into the complexity of these biological systems. Nowadays, we can sequence individual cells. And so the insights that that has driven has been things like understanding that a, an individual cancer uh, or sorry, an individual tumor isn't just one mutation, but really it's a, it's a collection of different mutations. And so when you're treated with one drug, you might kill half that tumor, but recurrence is driven by a different mutation. We also have better tools for analyzing large data sets, a lot of the things that, that you guys have been learning about today. Um, increased automation and in experimentation. So biology, again, used to be someone with a pipette, kind of petri dish. Uh, to flask. Now we have robotic systems that can screen thousands of compounds against thousands of different cells and generate a massive amount of data. Um, and finally, uh, the ability to precisely perturb these systems. So when I think about what's really going to drive biology forward, you know, there's this whole let's measure and characterize things. But now we can actually run uh, better experiments. Uh, so rather than just you know trying to create a bunch of mutations in a cell, select the one that has uh, some function that we're interested in, we can actually take, and I think CRISPR is really what's driving this, another invention here from Berkeley, and say, okay, we're going to make one precise change to the cell. We're going to see what it does. We can measure before and after, and we can actually do, uh, do better experiments. So we talked about uh, the declining pl the price of, of collecting data. We've talked about kind of the explosion of, um, of genomes that are being collected. I'd actually like to take a poll from the audience. So who here has had themselves sequenced? 
through 23andMe or something else. Okay, kind of a handful of people. Now, I'll, now keep your hands up. Now, how many of those people discovered something like clinically relevant? Yeah, not, not a whole lot. Um, and so I think the, the, the reason for that is that you know, we actually don't know the right level of description of biology. So we have the tools for measuring the genome, so that's why there's this explosion of data. But if we look at what you know, people look like, there's actually much more levels. So we have the genome, which is the DNA. You have the transcriptome, which is the RNA. Those code for proteins, the proteome. And we don't really have the tools for actually measuring these levels of biology yet, or at least not affordably. Uh, and so as those tools come, you know, come into existence, I think we'll see this graph, but for all those other levels. And as you can imagine, the data is even going to be more or even larger. Uh, and so we're going to need the tools to analyze those. And I think the reality is uh, for understanding biology and using that relevantly, we're probably going to have to have uh, different data at different levels and maybe a combination of that, which is, I think, a whole other problem. How can we do analysis across different kinds of data um, to drive a single, a single insight? So I'm going to talk about some of the companies. Oh, actually, there was one more point I was going to make. So not only can you save people's lives, but there's a lot of money here, um, which investors care about. Um, so about 20% of, uh, of the economy is spent in healthcare. Usually a commonly one on stat, but just in case people don't know. So I'm going to talk about some of the companies that we've invested in and how they're using data science to actually drive drug discovery or the treatment of disease. So the first one is Atomwise. So what Atomwise does is they want to understand, okay, is this compound going to bind to this protein? And that can be a measure of efficacy, of also side effects. Uh, and the way they do that is they, they use deep learning. And so I'm not sure how many people are familiar with how deep learning works here or if you're going to learn that in the future. Um, but the tools that you use to decompose an image usually have a red color channel, a green color channel, and a blue color channel. So they can take those same tools, but instead of colors, they say, OK, well, I have a carbon channel, I have an oxygen channel, I have a nitrogen channel. And so all of the research that's coming out of you know, some of the leading labs can be kind of repurposed and applied to this specific problem. And the reason uh, drug discovery, or the reason drug companies care about this um, is the current process for doing this is, is usually very manual. So they actually go and run experiments. They have compounds of thousands of libraries. Um, they have different assays and cell types. Uh, and they have robotic systems that actually kind of measure those. But um, it takes a long time, and it's really expensive. And so they would much rather do it in a computer if they could, and only test you know, the top 100 that they think might be relevant. So there's another company that we invest in called Recursion Pharmaceuticals. They're also using computer vision uh, to, to discover drugs. But the way they do it is a little different. So they have cellular systems that they stain to create these images. And then they take pictures of those and analyze them. And so this is a control. This is just the cells. And this is an, ex an, an experiment where they've actually introduced uh, some drug. Now we can look at those images and we can tell, you know, they kind of, they look different, but kind of the words that you might use to describe those, it's really hard. So what recursion can do is they can extract a thousand different features from each of these images and they can then plot those in some space. And we can say, well, we have some understanding of what, you know, normal health, healthy cells look like, this control set. Now, over here we have a model of what these disease cells look like. Now we can take that and we can actually start introducing drugs. And so what happens when we take these disease cells and we, and we try some potential treatment on them? And that's these red, these, these red circles right here. And we can see, well, as we try and treat these drugs, we move them closer and closer to what the healthy cells look like. You know, so the direct line axis here, you can think of as treatment. And the nice thing about this model is kind of off axis, you can think of as side effects. So now we have this interesting model for thinking about what does healthy look like, what does disease look like, and how can we introduce different drugs um, and kind of measure their, measure their effects and predict what they might do in, in larger systems. Finally, I want to talk about uh, a company called Sequence Bio. So as Joanne mentioned, you know, data is really like the most important thing here. Um, and so Sequence Bio is really a data play. So there's a founder population up in Newfoundland, Canada. And for those of you that don't know what a founder population is, it's a, it's a population um, that has low genetic diversity, usually because there's very little immigration. Um, and founder populations tend to have higher prevalences of disease. So the nice thing about, uh, about this population is 
when you start taking a bunch of samples and you're trying to analyze this large data set, you have a lot less noise. You also have higher signal if there's higher prevalence of disease. And so what we can see here, this is a map of Newfoundland, and we can see all of the, um, all of the pockets of higher prevalences of interesting diseases. So over here, this little province has a high, uh, high prevalence of breast cancer. Um, over here, colon cancer. Uh, and there's a long tail of other diseases. So this is really a right population, I think, for doing data collection on and then a subsequent analysis. So those were three companies that, that we've invested in that I think are applying some of the tools or generating data that the tools that you guys are going to learn about um, will be applied to. Uh, I think the one thing that we were supposed to talk about is how do VCs think about this space um, in general. So I'm going to end with that. You know, if you guys are thinking about starting a company or you're thinking about joining a startup company, what are the things that VCs think about? Well, the first thing is about team. So I care that founders have domain expertise. And so I think what's happening now is as, uh, as analytic tools become kind of more prevalent and more widely known, having very specific domain expertise is really important. So when I invest in a computational biology company, I don't really want people that really understand computer science and statistics and all the tools that they're going to be applying, but they need to understand the underlying biology. So they have the context within which to apply these tools. Um, technology. So I want to see compelling science, and I want to see proprietary, high-quality data sets. So in biology, there's actually a lot of publicly available data. Part of the problem with that data is you don't know under which conditions it was collected. And so sometimes it's really hard to take these different data sets uh, and kind of compute across them, because biology, by its nature, is a very kind of noisy, uh, noisy science. And finally, the market. So in biology or in health, I want there to be a large kind of unmet clinical need. So something where you know, a, a particular customer or maybe a patient you know, isn't getting um, you know, the product that they need. Uh, so that if you guys do solve all these really hard problems, you know there's a customer kind of on the other end. Thank you. <laughs> James, thanks so much, and uh, also Joanne as well. So we have uh, we have five minutes or so for questions to either James, Joanne, both, or whatever. Yes, there's one right there. Thank you. Hi, thank you both for the presentation. Um, James, I had a question for you with regards to the computational biology uh, programs that you're looking at. So it's two questions. One is, how has that played out? I understand how these programs help in drug discovery. How yeah. does that play out? in terms of actual efficacy in real trials. So yeah. are, they, are there actually marked improvements because of the data science that's being used? And the second question is, where do you see kind of the next set of major data science applications outside of just drug discovery yeah. in healthcare space? Um, so the first one, uh, do there have been some, so the, the hope is yes, that pushing better analytics early in the process will help downstream. <coughs> Certainly that needs to be tested, and it's not necessarily going to be true in every case. And there is a lot of noise. Drugs fail for all sorts of reasons, and for reasons that you can't necessarily detect early on. Um, I will say, um, you know, Amgen, for example, acquired a company called Decode, uh, which, similar to Sequence Bio, was sequencing the founder population of, um, of uh, Iceland. And it's well known that that's influenced, uh, you know, three to four kind of programs that they've been running. So I do think there is strong like uh, empirical evidence that this kind of analytics and these kinds of data collection efforts can, can in meaningfully in influence uh, clinical programs. Um, your other question was about, can you repeat that? Uh, what other options outside of drug discovery do you see data science applications in the pipeline? Yeah, so I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of diagnostics historically have been let's find one biomarker uh, to separate a population into either responders or non-responders or someone who has disease or doesn't. And I think that's, um, that's not a very good way to look at it because a lot of these populations, the distributions actually overlap heavily. And so I think now what people are doing is they're looking at more complex biomarkers. So how can I look at three or four different things or a whole set of markers and use that to define disease or not disease and that driving you know, better treatment decisions? That's what I'd say. Okay. Questions, yes sir. Um, actually, that, that might be for either of you. How does a startup get a proprietary data set? 
Like, isn't that something that needs a lot of money and a lot of time? I, I can start. So I think um, as investors, we want we want to invest in companies that solve business problems no matter what, right? Whether they use data, they use technology, they don't use technology at all, that's totally fine. So from day one, uh, the, the offering has to solve a meaningful <laughs> business problem better than existing solutions. The second part is as they start to solve this problem, one way to collect data could be from their their customers, right? So in the, uh, let's say, customer success uh, bot will acquire more and more case studies and more and more data of customers interacting with them. And as a result, the N plus one customer should have a uh, better experience because of the self-learning um, uh, uh, the self -learning, uh, technologies that it's using. The third part to consider is we like to see companies that have a way of collecting data and also uh, improving the, uh, the data asset in a way that's not costly. Right? So if you can get your customers to be your mechanical Turks uh, in some way or, or shape or form, that is the best uh, scenario. So paying for data is the last resort, if that's necessary, but there are other ways to think about building something that, that produces value and collects data. One last question. Uh, let's take, yes, gentleman in the back row there. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, question for Joanne. Um, so in terms of chatbots, I'm under the impression that right now it's kind of like question and answer. So it's, it's roughly, it's roughly uh, simple, but I'm wondering what's the evolution of the conversation AI? So you mentioned that, you know, the chatbot knew that you like Pantene because of historical things, but is there any sort of like uh, value in adding like emotional intelligence or um, something, something in the future for that? Sure, so right now, the, the state of the art is really very, very narrow chatbots that can automate uh, what humans can do, right? So recruiting and doing some fairly simple recruiting is possible. Uh, it, it's, I think over time, what you'll find is these general purpose chatbots that are able to be the marketer, be the salesperson, be the customer support for one organization. And this is really, really meaningful because organizations have never had multi-function software solutions before. It has never been possible. So I think the next step in the next couple of years is that over time, your guess is as good as mine. And for the, for the medium term, you know, uh, sentiment analysis, being a more a human uh, kind of partner, uh, just the data science behind it is incredibly complex. A chance for one more question, did you? Yep, we'll just bring bring it down here. Thank you. Is that all right? So you mentioned in that slide about the three things, and second thing was about technology, and you said the technology has to be compelling, and so you're expecting to invest in a company which already has a proven kind of a prototype, or is that what the expectation is, or you are willing to guide somebody who has the right ideas and the skill sets? What exactly is? Yeah, this is the one. Uh, so I, I think the answer to your question is, is the, you know, the VC ecosystem is, is a little bit more like maybe complicated or sophisticated in that there's uh, VCs that specialize at each layer. So Joanne and I are both kind of at this layer where we're expecting a product, um, you know, kind of a, a, a team, you know, that started to coalesce around something. Um, I think there's a, there's a much earlier stage of venture, kind of a pre-seed or seed round, where you know, maybe it's just a team that's trying to iterate on an idea. Um, and so if, if you're just starting your company, you don't, you, know, you don't have compelling data yet, or you, you, maybe you haven't invented the technology yet, you know, those are the kinds of VCs that you want to engage with. And then you know, after that, you'll, gr you'll graduate to kind of larger, larger check sizes and VCs that expect a more sophisticated company um, and so I think where we sit, you know, yeah, yes, we tend to expect kind of coalesce teams, technology, and, and data sets, you know, going back to your question. And Berkeley has actually a lot of resources. If you're starting to think about starting a company, uh, Berkeley has, you know, funding, funding sources for very early stage teams, grants, uh, there's uh, incubation competitions, I'm judging one tomorrow, a launch, uh, that will give you some angel capital. Now, as investors, we love to develop relationships from the beginning with teams, right? So even if, 
Uh, you're not at a point where you have a product, you have customers. We still want to meet you. So come, come hang out with us. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you.